So, a little studio tour. This is my little baby, um, API 1608. Amazing mixer, amazing preamp, four band EQ on all channels. It's, yeah, it's an amazing machine. There's not much I can say about it. You have to hear it, really. Um, with uh, around it, a lot of outboard gear. We got a massive passive here that I use on the master. We got a UBK modified fatso there. On the other side, we have like two FX or all exciters that I use on drums often. We've got an Alice's 3630, the legendary Daft Punk normally compressor. I never got it to sound right, but anyway. Got a Chandler Germanium there, mono compressor. We got uh, an API 2500, which is uh, uh, my master bus compressor. That's my patch bay. Um, then what do we have? This is the MPC 5000 that I use for drums, uh, mainly because I can I can take all the drums into separate outputs and run them through the mixer and through the preamps and apply EQ in it, which is really annoying to do um, with a computer, like routing everything outside and back in. It's really boring. Um, speakers here. We've got a pair of Focal Solo 6. We've got classic NS stands I couldn't live without. We got Orotone that are actually learning how to use, but when you know what to do with them, they're really, really amazing at setting like vocals level and things like that. If we want to go under, here we have an AMX or MX-16 reverb, Neve reverb, and Sonic DP4. We have a DBX compressor that I, I barely used. Um, we have this old Akai digital reverb that I really like um, on drums and, and bass, synth bass. Neve 33609, amazing stereo compressor. This is the Max BCL that most of you probably know as the L2, which is the um, classic limiter everybody uses on the master. This is actually the hardware version that has the compressor, which is the R comp in the Waves plugins. The max bass, which enhances the bass, the bottom end, but it's not really reliable. I wouldn't use that too much. And then this section is the actual L2. It's a really good machine, really handy to have on your master to, to see what your mix will sound like when they're finished. Um, on the other side there, it's, it's more nerdy and less sexy, but that's, um, that's my Pro Tools HD system. These are really amazing RME 32 in and out converters. That is basically all my my audio inputs and outputs go through that. Um, that is my my input patch bay that has been custom built especially for me and for this mixer to allow to run um, line signals to into microphone inputs. Because if you use the DI inputs of the mixer, you're actually bypassing the transformer, which is the whole point of this mixer is actually to hit the transformer as hard as you can to get that nice distortion and that nice fat sound. So that's why we did that so I can record since through the transformers. So that is one bit. Then we can go maybe over here. We have well classic um really classic sense up Odyssey main condition. Um I bought that in from some guy in Poland that actually is a, a sin reseller. Um again it, it arrived here really it's it's perfect. Um, under this, we have a, an Octave, the Kitten, which is the smaller version of the Octave Cat. Uh, it's really, really fat oscillators. Um, it, it's just it, like you could more think of like soul wax sounding, more that kind of like really driven um, sound, really, really big. I actually thought I was buying a cat when, when I bought this one, but this came out of the box, so... We got a um, SP1200 here uh, that I bought not so long ago, maybe a couple of months ago. I didn't get to use it the way I, I want it yet. Um, you, you need to get used to it and, and to the way it works and the way you sample it. Also need to get used to the filtered outputs because it has eight separate outputs, but all of them have a different filter on it, which is weird a little bit, but <laughs> uh, this is just the way it is. If that annoys you as much as it annoys me, if you use balance cables, 
with the separate outputs, you can actually bypass the filter. So you can have eight unfiltered outputs for the nerds out there. What else do we have? Really cheap, simple Behringer tuner, but if you work with analog synth, I would recommend everybody to have one of those because it has a little microphone here. And you can basically tune anything that comes out of your speakers, which saves me a lot of time because I don't have to plug a tuner actually at the back of every synth. And because all my synths are plugged into a patch bay, I always have to go back to the patch bay to plug, unplug, replug. This is a really great investment if you work with, with this type of gear. Um, MIDI interface, not much to say about that. This is an analog solution red square. It's a semi-modular synth, as in it's a bit of the same ar architecture as an ARP 2600. Some of the oscillators are already patched in the background, let's say, but you can still root them the way you want. It's, it's also really fat sounding, um, but it, it does sound a bit like, it does sound like a modular. It, it doesn't have the attack, um, attack is really slow. You don't really do m like percussive sounds with it, but it's really fat, like the bottom end is really fat. Here we have a, a Focusrite preamp that I don't recall ever using for anything, ever. So, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, Pro One, sequential, sequential circuit. Can you, how do you say that? Yeah. Okay, sequential circuits. Pro One, which is basically one voice of the Prophet 5. Um, so, inside of Prophet 5, you have five of this. This is awesome at, at bass lines and leads. It's so, so fat. Then we have an SH-101 here that I think everybody knows. Really, um, really big for, for all the techno stuff, but I use it more for the early 80s, early 90s house sound, like bass sounds. Um, really also a really good synth if you want to start um, using analog synth. It's a really good starting point. It's really simple, all the informations are here, and it sounds good straight away. So, Then here we have a Dave Smith um, Prophet 8, which is again, Dave Smith actually started Sequential Circuits and now has his own brand because I think the other, the other one went bankrupt or something, anyway. And this is like a Prophet 5, but with 8 voices instead of 5. Um, really similar sounding, I would say a little bit more bright, uh, a little bit more, a little bit less actually bottom end, more thin, but really powerful, completely analog. Um, and if you ever buy one of those, because I did the mistake to buy the one with the endless rotary, which is a, it's a disaster. So make sure you get the ones with the rotary that stop from zero to the max, because the infinite rotary ones, it's really not good. I actually even think they stopped making them. Um, here we have like a lot of little pedals and this is what I use when, when I need a bit of um, inspiration, let's say. When I have a sound that's a bit dull or like something I think that needs to be different, I have, I have it all set up on a patch bay here and um, I can just send the SH-101 to the Eventide, the Eventide to the Moog filter, the Moog filter to the distortion, then back to I can really patch it the way I want and then back into the mixer. So yeah, it's really a f kind of like toys to, to try to get something to stick out of a mixer to sound a little bit less um, classic, really. Here we have um, Analog Solutions again. It's called the Semblance. It's a copy of the Oberheim SEM synth that Oberheim actually is making again now. It sounds really, really amazing. And it's one of the only synths I actually have that has different types of filters. It has a low pass, it has a high pass, a bypass, and, and a notch, yeah. So it's four types of filters, and it sounds really dirty and really, like, for leads. And, and if you want, like, really acid and really percussive bass sounds, this is incredible. And it's actually quite cheap. What else do we have? There in the background, we have like some other synth. I think there's a Casio, there's a Roland string machine. There's a SH-1000, which is the first synth uh, Roland ever made, back from 1972. I bought mine out of the box, brand new. 
somebody was putting it on eBay as I walked into a record store, um, a music store, sorry. And I just took it home. That's what I, that's what did the, um, the bass line at the end of Paris, actually, the big bass line. Uh, here we have a Prophet 5, which is a Prophet 5. Uh, I mean, all the 80s records you've ever heard that have since sound, it was probably this one. Under it, we have the Jupiter 8, probably my favorite synth in the world. It's on every single aeroplane record that has ever been released. I know it by heart. I know every knob, every function. It's, it's awesome. If you can find one, buy it at any price, but it's getting really difficult to, to, to find these, especially in good conditions like, like mine was and still is. What else? So we keep going with the Roland GX3P. Really, really like the synth. It's it's really versatile. You can do anything from from more old vintagey sounding bass lines to more like lush pads. It has a really nice chorus in it, um, and it's it's pretty useless unless you have this, the PG200, which is the the programmer that goes with it. Um, Funny fact, the synth cost me 150 euros 10 years ago. It was my first synth and this cost me around 400 euros. So like nearly four times the price of the synth because these are really rare. Um, yeah, same thing. If you find one, buy it. It's, it's definitely worth buying. Under it, we have a Juno 106, which is these two could kind of like kind of the same category of synths, except that this is way fatter. This is really, this is thinner, this is really like fat and dirty. I don't know why the Juno 106 is so dirty, but it is. If you have one, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, same thing, really, really classic of the late 80s and house music stuff. And it's one of the only synth I know that has a poly portamento. So usually glide and portamento works with um, monophonic sounds. And this one works with polyphonic sounds. So you can apply that to, to chords. That's, you can hear that in a lot of Detroit techno tracks when the chords go anyway. If you know the records, you know what I'm talking about. It's really hard to explain with words. Um, another classic, DX7. This one is a DX7 2D, which is one of the latest version. And you can actually play two patches in one DX7, which is pretty handy. Why did I buy that one? Just because that's the only one I found. Um, under that, we have legendary sampler, the ASR10. Uh, Timbaland, Kanye West, um, the Neptunes, Daft Punk, uh, Alan Brax and Fred Falky. I think you did um, you did a video with them when they explained that they did that intro track, recording the bass in this sampler. Um, anyway, it has a really distinct and specific sound. Uh, it, it's a great piece of gear, but you really need to look for that sound to use it. It's not transparent at all. Mm, we keep going. Under there, there's an interesting piece of gear here. It's called a KMS30. Um, as you can say, as you can see, it says MIDI synchronizer. It's basically a machine that takes any sync signal you throw at it and transforms it into all the other sync signal that exists. So basically, if you give him a tape sync signal, it will convert it into um, DIN sync and into MIDI clock. If you give it MIDI clock, it would convert it into tape sync and into DIN, etc., etc., and all the combinations you can possibly think of. And funny fact, if you look for these on eBay now, they're really expensive, and this one got given to me by the guy who actually sold me the DX7 because he had no idea what it was. I knew what it was, but he didn't. So I took it and run. Um, here we have my best friend. Alongside the Jupiter 8, it's probably... The Jupiter A is probably my favorite polyphonic synth, and this is probably my favorite monophonic synth. It's a knob 2600. Um, is the exact right model, because there's different models through the years, because they copied the Moog filter, and, um, and so Moog attacked them. They went to chord because they couldn't obviously use that, so then they changed the filter, but this one is the pre chord case model, so it has the copy of the MOOC filter, which is the, the best sounding filter of all the ARPs. Um, and it's, it's mint, it's per perfect condition, it sounds awesome. Um, with something that's quite rare too, the original keyboard. 
which is difficult to find. I use it sometimes when, when I want more of a um, kind of like loose feel or more of a live feel to what I'm playing. It's actually way more responsive than any MIDI you could send to it. And, um, and that's, the only, that's also the only way to use the portamento on this synth, it's with the original keyboard. Um, yeah, love this synth. What's that little box? Oh, this little box, it's something I bought in LA. Uh, I can't even remember what it's called. It's called a pocket piano by Crit Kreiter and Guitari. Um, it's basically a digital FM synth. It's really, really cheap. Um, I could, I could, I could plug it after, but it, it's um, it has like a built-in arpeggiator and like it's a really, really strange machine. Uh, I used it in 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 a couple of records that are gonna come out soon. Uh, it's two hundred dollars, um, but it's really inspiring. Really, really worth it. And yeah, I like. You gotta love the wooden knobs. Uh, when I brought this back from the United States, it was a bit difficult for me to explain the customs, what this was. Because it doesn't really look like anything. It looks like a, actually it looks like a bomb a bit. Um, there, what do we have? So then, uh, under all the crap that's on top of it, we have my go-to keyboard when I have to write and compose um, music. It's an old piano which basically just does piano sounds, uh, Rode, uh, Wurlitzer, and, and some clavinet, but it's not really good at clavinet, to be honest. And uh, yeah, but for piano sounds and road sound, it's really awesome. The keyboard really has like that, that nice piano feel you want from, uh, from these type of things. Um, and yeah, if you record that in stereo, it's really difficult in, in a mix to make the difference between that and a real piano take. Um, also because a lot of the effects in it um, I'm meant to to emulate rooms and compressions and you have some reverbs and it's also different type of mic uh, miking the way they sample the different type of pianos it's really it's, it's quite expensive compared to the competition that do these kind of things uh, but it's it's really worth it it's really good sounding uh, here we got an iPhone which uh, actually made it to a record once there was a little uh, app with just a a little thing that you could make like rises and falls on it and that made it to a remix uh, into a remix I can't remember which one anyway um, Moog Minitor brand new I had a little fatty um, that I actually still have but I didn't I wasn't really happy with the architecture of it it just was annoying me and um, yeah this is really tiny it's it's often the first bass sound I use like when I get out of the virus stuff it's always the first bass sound I kind of try and use I mean, it's Moog, it's too isolated, it's really fat, Moog filter. Only thing it misses is the sine wave. If it would have had a sine wave, well, that would be a mini Moog, I guess. But yeah, a apart from that, it's actually a, a, a perfect copy of the Taurus, which had no sine wave, if I recall. What else do we have? Um, the virus. It's, it's an, I mean, speaking about technology, that is an incredible machine. Um, it's multi-temporal, you can, you can have to up to 16 times, this one panel you see can be playing 16 different sounds that you can all edit separately. It's digital, but it's still, it's still one of the best digital sounding piece of gear you could really possibly buy to me. It's, it's mainly inspired from the PPG synths. You have all the wavetable thing going on inside. Whenever you're looking to make a sound that's, that's different, um, that that's weird you can go through that and like trust me you it, it, there's like 300 um, waveforms in there that you can pick from so that will do the job it also does pretty well every classic synth sound you can possibly think of like a um, simple one os bass lines or like classic Jupiter 8 like uh, pads and so this bit is, is more of a, of a storage um, shell, really. It's, it's where I put all the drum machines and the stuff that I use only when I need them. Um, so we have a um, Obram DMX here that just came back from, from fixing that its min condition works perfectly. That, that is 
used on the, the next styroplane single that's going to come out. It's all DMX drums. We have an 808 here that is also um, out of maintenance and that is working like the first day it came out of the box. It's perfect. We have a drum tracks here. That was one of the early, all the early aeroplane stuff was a lot of drum tracks. Like the Sebastien Tellier remix and, and all those tracks were, were done with this. I love the snare to death. I hate the bass drum. It's to me the, the worst bass drum ever. It's kind of tried to be like a Lindrum, but it's, I really don't like it. Um, we got an interesting little machine. It's a Simon's Claptrap, which, um, like let's say cameo word up, you know, that really specific snare clap sound. Um, it's this with just the noise, but it's also, yeah, it imitates pretty well um, human claps. It's it's really well designed machine. Um, and this one, I, I got it, I got it also brand new. Um, I received it in the box, like nobody ever used it before I actually opened it, which was pretty crazy. And what else do we have? We have a Tesco here, Analog Echo. Um, that Solowax gave me once to try it. And, and one day I told them, I need to give you your Echo back. And they were kind of like, whatever. So it's still here. If you want it back, you can have it back. Um, but yeah, I'd rather keep it. But if you want it back, you can. Just ask me. This is a um, TR707, classic Roland drum machine. Uh, under that, we have Yamaha RX-5, which is more of a late 80s, kind of like cheesy sounding drum machine. But sometimes that's exactly what you need. So here we have a tambourine, really specific. What do we have here? Um, DDD-1, really interesting drum machine by Korg, which apparently from my research uh, has been used a lot by Jelly Bean in the late 80s, apparently. Um, yeah, again, it's really specific. It has a really nice bass drum in there. Really, really good bass drum. What else do we have here? We have an SH32, which was a, an old reissue that Roland did years ago that was kind of meant to emulate the SH101. It's actually, it's actually sound really good. It just looks really shit, but it, it, it sounds really good. Um, what do we, this is a Vocoda. Electro Harmonics voice box, really cheap and efficient vocoder. Then we have like nice little things like this. It's a Boss DR220A. I was actually looking for the 220E and, uh, and I bought the 220A, so it's not the one I wanted, but now I have it. It looks really cute with this really strange book in which you can copy the patterns. They were really funny back in the days with these things. So yeah, um, I've used this on a remix actually, on a remix I did for Block Party, but they rejected it, so nobody ever heard it. Um, Korg percussion, really cheap and cheesy percussions, but again, sometimes that's the way to go. Uh, this is a machine, it's from Versimatic, which I'm mainly known for doing um, like big organs. You know, with like pedals and like church organs. And this is mainly what this is for, but because it's a late 80s model, it has awesome drums in there. Really, really cool drum sounds. And here we have a TX81Z, which I bought pretty much for only one reason, which is the Lately Bass preset, which is a um, really classic house preset, which you can hear again in Daft Punk face to face is the bass line through all the track. What do we have here? We got a torque box. Jesus, that's he heavy. Um, we got a torque box. We got another one of those DBX compressors. And here, if you can see it, it's the really first Mackie mixer from like the early 90s. Um, maybe not the really first, actually. I don't know why I'm saying that, but it's like the original like Daft Punk mixer, blah, blah. As you can see, I'm not using it at all. So yeah, this is more specific gear that I use whenever I'm looking for something, you know, you don't use 808 drums on all your tracks. So um, whenever I need one, well, I have one. We have also some other stuff here. We've got a 
as I've learned guitar for years, um, I play guitars live on the track sometimes. So this is a, a Strat. Oops. We got a copy of a Gibson because a Gibson is really expensive and this one was really cheap and sounded actually pretty good. And we got a jazz bass. Fender jazz bass, all a bit dusty, but all perfectly working. And I think we've seen everything. <laughs>